Greetings and welcome to this edition of Campus Conversations. I'm Dan Mogula from the Campus Office of Communications and Public Affairs. Today, it's my pleasure to be joined by our Vice Provost for Graduate Studies and the Dean of the Graduate Division, Lisa Garcia Bedoya, and our Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, Oliver O'Reilly. Before we dive into today's discussion, just a few brief biographical words about our guests. In addition to her Vice Provost role, Lisa Garcia Bedoya is a professor in our School of Education, where she uses the tools of social science to re reveal the causes of educational and political inequalities. She's published six books, earning five national book awards. Lisa has consulted for presidential campaigns and statewide ballot efforts, and has partnered with over a dozen community organizations working to empower low-income communities of color. Vice Provost Oliver M. O'Reilly is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and this, believe it or not, is his 31st year as a faculty member. He is also the faculty athletics representative for the campus. His research, research and teaching feature a wide range of problems in the dynamics of mechanical systems, ranging from, wait for it, spaghetti strands, squealing brakes, motorcycle navigation systems, and shoelaces. Oliver was formerly chair of the Academic Senate and received a Distinguished Teaching Award in 1999. And as always, we welcome your questions throughout the conversation today. Just post them to our Facebook Live site, and we'll, we'll do our best to get to them as we proceed. Oliver and Lisa, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Um, Lisa, let me start with you. I mean, how long have you been in your role? And, and talk to us a little bit about what it's like to make that shift, to cross over that line from a member of faculty to also a member of the campus administration. Thanks, Dan. So I've been in this role since July 2019. I've been a faculty member at Berkeley since 2008. And if people can remember back to 2019, that was the fall of power shutoffs, uh, wildfires, then we had the wildcat strike that December, then we had pandemic shutdown in March and racial reckoning in June. And so it was quite a transition um, in, ten, in the sense of seeing every possible thing that could go wrong, I guess, on campus, short of locusts. And it was exciting, though, to be um, in community with a group of people who were really focused on how to take care of our students and how to make sure this incredible institution kept going in the face of all of these great challenges. And so it was a bit of a wild ride, um, but it's it's a privilege to have the opportunity to have that systemic and, and structural impact on, on how the university, the university works and how it moves forward in its public mission. Anything that surprised you along the way when you think back about what your expectations were going into this role and what reality has served up? I, I've been surprised how much I like it, I guess. I think of all the times that I've been on campus and wondered, you know, why do we do things this way? And it's been so gratifying to be able to be in a position to say, can we stop doing it that way and have that work? I've also just been really impressed at how much our leadership care about our students and care about the well-being of staff, faculty, and students on campus. And so uh, feeling good about the people that I work with has also been um it's not surprising, but it's it's been nice that it's worked out that way. Yeah, um, Oliver, same same for you. What? How long have you been in office? Remind us in, in your vice provost role, and what have you learned? What surprised you along the way as you made that shift? Yeah, so I served as the interim since July twenty twenty. <laughs> Feels like forever ago, to July 2021, and then I was appointed the per, the to the permanent VPUE in July 2022. So the transition has been it's been very interesting in terms of um, spending a year, a sort of in a caretaker role mm -hmm. and seeing the issues, seeing the challenges, seeing the opportunities, and then getting to think about them as you interview for the position and really start to refine them. There's nothing like going through an interview process to do that to you. Um, and, and so that's been a great, that was been actually a very good process. And I've actually, and I just like Lisa said, I really love my job and I really enjoy it. Um, I was fortunate to be this chair of the Senate at the start of the pandemic. Mm. So that helped me immeasurably in this current role because I made a lot of connections with people because we all had to, you know, the scale of the challenges were just so immense that we all had, everybody had to work together. 
And uh, it was really an inspiring group of people to work with. And I, you know, the care that people had for faculty, staff, and students in all the meetings was really, it was inspiring. And then the connections I made with people was were just very, very helpful when I started as an interim. Um, prior to that, I was a faculty member and I did uh, a service over the past tw 27 years as faculty member before that. So I sort of got some idea of how complicated the system was, but really I had no idea till I became, till I was sent a chair and we had to sort of take everything apart and build it back together again. Uh, that's when I realized just how complicated the, the university is and how it takes everybody working together to make it work. You know, the, the students, undergraduates and graduate students have to work together in partnership with the faculty, with the administration, department chairs, deans, alumni, prospective students. The whole thing has to sort of work together in this really when, and when it's working together in a synergistic way, it's really amazing. And I feel the campus has done that, despite all the challenges, you know, the, the wildfires, the pandemic, the power outages, social justice movements and awareness, some difficult elections. We've sort of, we've really batted above our average, I feel, in a way that makes me proud to be here. Yeah. And I, so I, I think the public, the fact that we're a public institution doing batting above our way average the way we are and helping so many, so many students is, is really, I find it just remarkable and very inspiring. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I'm also noting your use of sports metaphors and don't worry, I will ask you about your role as faculty athletics representative. Um, but Lisa, I mean, you know, the pandemic has played such a huge role in our personal lives and institutional lives over the last few years. And there's all this talk out there uh, in the workplace about the new normal and about changes. What do you think, what changes have you noticed? And do you see the beginnings of a new normal insofar as the graduate student experience and role is on our campus? What, what's, the, what's the pandemic done? What changes it's, is it going to leave in its wake? That's a really good question that I think is still in process. I think the most important thing the pandemic demonstrated was the profound inequities that existed on campus in terms of students' ability to navigate their time at Berkeley um, emotionally, financially, academically, and all of that. And so I think the, the fissures that were already there just got a little wider um, during the pandemic. And the good news is I think we developed a lot of new muscles to help support students. And so basic needs did a tremendous job. There was great coordination between my staff and their staff and other staff in equity inclusion and student affairs who really just got together to try to figure out how do we support students in distress in ways that we hadn't seen in the past, but were in some ways byproducts of what was already there. I think we're in a transitional moment right now, and I'm not sure anyone knows where we're going to land. What keeps me up at night is that I think the, the ways in which students presented in distress has changed as a result of the pandemic. And so I'm not sure we'll know, especially with graduate students, it's easy for them to, to sort of fall off the radar, to not come to campus. And so making sure that our students are well and moving forward, I think is, is a big challenge that we're trying to address. I think also there seems to be an anecdotal evidence that there was some, I think there was, we all went through some sort of existential crisis over the last few years of really rethinking how we're spending our time, what we're doing with our lives, wanting to feel like what we're doing is meaningful. And, and a number of students have left our programs. And so it's all still shaking out a little bit. Uh, the students who were close to finishing finished. It's really those ones that were in the middle uh, of their programs that I that I worry about and that I think it's going to take a number of years for us to really understand what this moment has meant for us as a society and as a campus, psychologically, emotionally, and professionally. And so we're just trying to do our best to help people get through these bumps in the road. But I think the impacts are going to be longstanding. And I, I would hope that all of us will be more compassionate with ourselves and with one another, and that the students who went through this as they go into the professoriate will be better able to support and be flexible with their students. And so I would like to think that the academy will shift as a result of this, but I think we're still in those early days and, and the ultimate outcomes are still 
not entirely clear. So when you say the academy will shift, are you talking to be about being more compassionate, more financially supportive, all of the above? What do, what do you mean by that the academy will shift? I think there has been more curricular innovation on this campus over the last three years than probably has happened at least during my time here right. and maybe decades before that, right? Faculty were really forced and graduate student instructors and lecturers and everyone were really forced to pivot in terms of their courses on a dime, right? Literally from one day to the next. And what that did though, was introduce people to new tools. People had to really think about ways to use technology perhaps that they hadn't had the opportunity to do before. And so I think our, our teaching is better because we, um, I know a lot of faculty are using flipped classroom as an example, really thinking about what the classroom experience, how to maximize that interaction and maybe deliver content asynchronously, asynchronously in different kinds of ways. I think thinking about assessment more deeply, how is it, what is it that we want students to learn? How do we know whether they've learned it? What are the different ways that they can demonstrate that knowledge? being more aware of psychological distress and its its impact on academics. I think we already knew that, but reached a whole other level during the pandemic. And I would hope all of that means that we just have a much more student-centered approach to education, that our classrooms are much more supportive, supportive, exciting, interactive, and engaging, and that we move forward with a, a bigger toolkit in terms of what we offer to students and the ways in which we can impart knowledge to students that really takes into consideration that they're coming from different places, they have different needs, they have different learning styles, and that it's our job as faculty to make sure that we're able to educate everyone regardless of, of those differences. Wow, a lot to chew on in that answer, amazing. Um, Oliver, same question for you. What do you think, what changes have you seen as a result of the pandemic? Which do you think are lasting? What's the impact been? Just, and I know we're still in the middle of it, and times early, but when you step back, what do you think of in that regard? So I think there's, well, just to add to what Lisa said, I think there's much more of an emphasis now on engagement, on deliberate engagement of students and making classrooms more inclusive in a way that we didn't really think about it before the pandemic. Um, I also think we're much more thoughtful about our online tools that we're using. I think one of the big things that's come out of the uh, pandemic is that there's no longer this clarion cry for online everything, online education, that people have seen that just simply putting material online and expecting everyone to learn is, is not effective and it doesn't, it just doesn't work. Um, that online education actually is, is far more expensive than people imagined. Uh, it needs far greater curricular development, it, pedagogy. It needs to be very thoughtfully done so you can you have engagement with students, so you, you're ensuring their learning. Um, but I also think that part of one of the things about the pandemic that, that I think is positive is that we've, we've appreciated each other. We've appreciated being around each other in ways that we didn't, we took maybe took for granted before. I mean, being in meetings, in-person meetings, where you see six six conversations happening at the same time, well, that's what's happening in classrooms in person as well, right? You're seeing students engage with each other, engage with the instructor in ways that are just much more difficult to do in, on Zoom and re remotely. Um, I do think, I agree with Lisa that we don't really know fully what's happened, the, the full consequences of the, of the pandemic on learning. I was reading last night that this uh, a new $3 million grant was given to a faculty member in the Graduate School of Education here, uh, working with the California Department of Public Education and UCSD to try and understand what's happened in K through 12 during the pandemic. And yes, there, it has exacerbated a lot of in inequalities. Um, and so we're gonna see that in our incoming students for the next, for the foreseeable future. And so I think it's up to us now to figure out like, what can we do to help these our student, the students who are coming in onto campus? And how can we support instructors so that some of the positive momentum that's happened with curricular innovation and uh, changes in how we teach, more increasing flipped classrooms, for example, how can we keep that momentum going? 
so that we really we achieve this transformation. And you know, when I first started here on the Berkeley campus 30 years ago, teaching meant just being able to understand knowing all the technical aspects of the course so you could answer questions from students in a, multiple ways. Now it's it's much more we also expect people to have inclusive classrooms. We expect people to engage with students. We expect different types of, of assessment. We ex uh, uh, expect accommodations, et cetera. It's, it's much more complicated. So building this infrastructure to support instructors with that, I think is also something that we have, that's coming out of the pandemic that we have to do and we have to be more deliberate about it. And, and that's exciting. Yeah, I'm gonna follow up. Uh Lisa, I, I want to ask you about this issue of how we support students, particularly in the context of you talking about this increased awareness of the extent to which students are distressed. But before I do, Oliver, I want to follow up on, on something you mentioned, um, and that was K through 12. Mm -hmm. What's come, what do you see, what's coming our way? Unpack that a little bit. I mean, obviously that's where all of our undergraduates come from. What's changing right. in the K, K through 12 world? So. Um, what we're hearing in the K through 12 world is that the, the pandemic has adversely affected students from historically excluded communities in the public schools. You mean disproportionately? Disproportionately, yeah. yeah. Um, we're also, from talking to instructors of first year courses, we're finding that they're spending more time focused on teaching and pedagogy, hmm. but they're also noticing that the students are not as prepared as they were previously. Hmm. We're noticing a, reduce, a re reduction in the number of students who've taken AP classes in high school. Hmm. Um, we, it's also, I think it's probably a little more difficult to gauge where the students' grades are because we no longer require standardized testing. And for whatever the issues with standardized testing, at least it gave us a second metric for how schools, uh, how schools graded and how schools performed that we don't have anymore. Um, one of the things that one of the things that from talking to instructors that has uh, that uh, that I think we have to find a way of addressing is, and Lisa talked about mentioned this earlier, is students come to class, uh, then they stop attending, then they listen to the lectures online, and then they stop listening to the lectures online. So they sort of they lo we lose touch with these students. And instructors have said it's just really hard to try and get them back. Hmm. Um, and it's possible this happened prior to the pandemic as well, but it just we didn't notice it because we didn't have all this technology that we can use to track if students are engaging in our classrooms. But I also feel because we've got that technology, we owe it to this, our students to try and find them and bring them back. So that's that's one thing that I'm that I've that I've spent a lot of time thinking about that I, that I and trying to find ways that we can deliberately engage and keep that engagement, I think is gonna be very important. That's both sobering and fascinating. Um, Lisa, before I come back to you, I just for those of you who joined us late, um, welcome to Campus Conversations. And just a reminder that we welcome your questions and they can be posted to our Facebook Live site. So Lisa, given all of this, it's just, almost a natural segue into something that I know you wanted to talk about. And that was, you know, how we're looking now holistically at student support. Talk to us a little bit about what that means programmatically and attitudinally. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. That's what we're really trying to do in graduate division is provide holistic support around students. And what we mean by that is really seeing students as whole people, appreciating that there are things that happen in your personal life, in your family life, in other ways that, that can influence your performance academically. I think especially in graduate school, just speaking from my own graduate student experience, I used to joke that I, I saw myself as a brain on a stick, that no one really cared about me. What mattered was what I produced intellectually and that was it. And that just doesn't work for our students. And I think it's not, the reality is you can't produce good research, you can't do good academic work if you're not well and centered, you know, as a person or if your family is in crisis. And so appreciating that students come to us with very different life experiences, the more we diversify our student populations, the more diverse their needs are going to be. We have student parents who had certain kinds of struggles during COVID in terms of childcare, depending on the age of their children, or you have 
folks who have family members who are chronically ill or who sadly passed away during the pandemic, or you have cultural differences for our international students who come into our classrooms and who may not necessarily understand that unwritten curriculum of how people are supposed to engage with one another. And so what we're trying to do is build different kinds of spaces on campus where students can find community, where students can get that information, where they, we can be transparent about expectations, what mentorship should look like, what advising should look like, so that everyone has a level playing field in terms of their information and understanding of how the system works, what's expected of them, what they can expect from faculty, and to know that they can find community rock climbing, or they can find community around their affinity group, or they can find community in other kinds of spaces on campus, both in their department and outside, to try to really address the fact that we are whole people and that you need to have that balance and that well-being at the center in order to fully take advantage of campus and fully take advantage of your potential, whatever that might be. And is your emphasis about the uh, regarding the importance and the value of community, is that a function of Berkeley's size, or is that something that you think is should and must be an inherent part of all quality education, particularly on the graduate student level? Personally, I think we learn, we are social beings, we learn in community. So I actually think that that's core to all educational spaces to be successful. I think it's especially challenging at Berkeley because of our scale and that graduate students sometimes tend to get very isolated in their departments. And, that, and so that's why community becomes a challenge because for example, if you are um, an underrepresented student, you may be the only one or one of two in your department and that can feel very isolating. But the fact of the matter is Berkeley has over 800 underrepresented doctoral students as an example on campus. We actually do have a critical mass of folks who might have shared life experiences with that student who's on their own in their department. And so helping them find that community, helping them find those other individuals, or if what it is is just feeling like, I really like music and I like to sing and that's something that's important to me and being able to find another set of people who can do that that the problem with Berkeley is that its scale is both its strength and its weakness, right? The, the beauty of this place is you can find somebody on this campus interested in anything that you could possibly think of, but the hard part is finding them. And so we're just trying to facilitate those connections so that people can have multiple spaces where they can explore different aspects of themselves and not feel like it's just this one thing. It's all about my research. It's about my professional future. It's about this small group of people that I happen to be in my program with, but instead take advantage of the full breadth and depth of the university. So you were, Lisa, you were talking before about, you know, the, the this holistic approach, wanting to increase or enhance the extent to which we support graduate students holistically. In my experience, anything new on campus comes with a price tag. So is this something that is a priority for the ongoing philanthropic campaign? How are we aligning our resources with the priorities you've been talking about? That is an excellent question, Dan, since resources are always a challenge in our public institution. I would say that what I've learned is that resources matter, obviously, but intentionality is also really important. And the fact of the matter is there are amazing things happening across this whole campus. And often the difficulty is just knowing about all of them. And so part of it is just having that North Star as a leader and really articulating that this is the goal, this is where we wanna be, this is the direction we wanna go and ask people to join in. And what I've learned is that with pretty minimal resources, I invested one and a half million dollars in our graduate diversity pilot program in the scheme of, of our university budget, not a whole lot of money to fund nine departments to do climate work um, in, in you know, relative to their particular community, what their community needs. And I think that work has amplified exponentially in terms of other ideas that have come out of that that we've then been able to implement within graduate division. So I think it's, it's about strategic investment, but I think more than anything, it's about that intentionality of being able to articulate a vision that people can join in with and that then they can move their boats in the same direction. So you're all rowing together instead of having a bunch of different separate boats doing their own thing. And that our job as, as, as academic leadership, I think is to just help people see how they can work together, make those connections, convene folks, make it easy for people to do the work that they wanna do. And once you multiply that across all the different spaces on campus, real change and real movement can happen in a relatively short period of time. Yeah. Oliver, what's uh, front and center for you um, in your role, vice provost, undergraduate education? 
I mean, Lisa talked eloquently about this need to look and sort of holistic support. We know what's front and center for her. What about you? So um, there's a, I would say access and accessibility is front and center for me. What does that mean? So I, I really want the campus to be more accessible to students. Um, so the, what I would like is uh, my, my vision is that we, you know, prospective students can see themselves in students on our campus and they can also see themselves in the alums. They can see different pathways through the campus for them for themselves. Um, they can see the the access to all of these different programs, but they can see them in a very easy way. Um, our campus, it, like as Lisa pointed out, it, you know, the strength is that it has all these different opportunities, but it's not very transparent. And that's really our weakness is that as a, as a campus, we can be very opaque. For instance, I've been here 31 years. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't learn something new about the campus. Now, that's great. That's the strength of the campus. But some things it shouldn't have taken me 31 years to figure out. Um, and if I'm that feel that way, how does it feel for a first year student? So there are several things we're doing to help with that. One is we're we're going to bring in a new curriculum management system that will help make advisors give advisors an easier job of advising students. So it will help advisors help students. It will also make help instructors advertise their courses and make just the curriculum more manageable. We've got 6,000 courses per semester on this campus, which is just stunning. And you know, there's courses in every subject and we have this amazing uh, comprehensive excellence. But it, this management system, even though it's a technical solution, will help to make that more transparent. Um, I'm also working to convene all the 80, there's 80 different academic support groups on campus. What? A, yeah, 80, yeah. See, you learned something new today too. Yeah, wait, wait um, like, give us an example of what an academic support unit is. Uh, biology scholars program, data science program, program data science scholars program, Cal nerds, Amgen scholars. And what and what's the common denominators when you say oh. academic? Yeah. They all provide academic support for students. For a particular a, a particular community or different things, different times? Different things, different times. So for instance, the Biology Scholars Program yeah. provides support for students who are interested in pursuing careers in the medical field. Got it. Um, and it provides a, a community. It provides mentoring, research experience, curricular help, tutoring. And it's really a, a, a village on our campus and it's it's it has it's been it's celebrating its 30th year this year it's a model for all these different programs but what we want to do is to bring all these programs together for the first time so that we can hear from them what we need to, what support we can provide to them to amplify their work and also to make their work more visible to other to the outside community especially to prospective students to start changing the narrative of Berkeley as not just being this place with these, you know, 6,000 courses, some of whom have 2,000 plus students, but also a place where you've got all of this support. And then in turn, finding out from the, the support groups, how we can better coordinate, how we can better communicate, and how we can reach out to foundations to get more support for these, for these groups. So I think, the other piece about accessibility is uh, accessibility and accommodations for students needing who are, are with the Disabled Students Program on our campus. And so one of the things during the pandemic is the number of students in the, the program has doubled. So it was about two and a half thousand before the pandemic. It's now f uh, nearly 5,000 students. Wait, and wait, just hold on a second. I want to make sure I understand this. So the number of students enrolled in our disabled students program has doubled. Yeah. And, um, and this is not just specific to Berkeley. This is That's where yeah, that's where I was yeah. going. Yeah, this is a nationwide phenomenon. Wow. Yeah, and many schools are many schools are just struggling with this demand. Um it, it touches all different areas of our campus. Um and so one of the things we're we're working to do is to basically improve teaching for instru instructing instruction for instructors so they can more easily accommodate students. We've also 
instigated a program called the, Dis, the, um, the DSP faculty liaisons. So right now we have two faculty liaisons and these two faculty, uh, Jonah Levy and Justin Davidson serve to inter they serve as liaisons between departments and the DSP program. And we're, in, we're, we're looking to expand that program because it, it's, been in, it's been in place for about a year now and it's been very successful. And many departments have used Jonah and Justin to, to help navigate this, this area. Um, but ultimately, if we can improve the way we teach instructors how to teach, then we can make a lot of issues about accommodating students. We can bake that in to the curriculum so it does not and the pedagogy so it does not become this pressure point that it is right now for instructors um, and that's if if i leave berkeley in this position having done that i will be really happy i think you wouldn't be the only one um you know lisa diversity has been both an explicit and implicit part of of a lot of what you and all have been talking about um, and, you know, the, the chancellor and other campus leaders have been clear about um, their dedication and commitment to enhancing the diversity of the student population, faculty and staff for that matter as well. Um, and in this instance, I just want to ask you about recently in the wake of the recent Supreme Court ruling regarding affirmative action, I noted that one of the justices who will, we will not name for the time being said he didn't understand what diversity meant and didn't see how it could possibly have anything to do in terms of the quality of education, of what the educational benefits are. And so obviously as a public institution, we need and want to represent the state we serve, but on a educational level, on a pedagogical level, what's the argument that you make? What are the value, what's the value that you see in diversity? Thank you for that. Um, I, I, I wanted to start though by saying, uh, an important thing we haven't talked about in terms of, of leadership on this campus is, is the importance of partnering with all different entities. So I wanna make sure it's clear that the work that we're doing has been in partnership with equity and inclusion and student affairs and Good the work point. Oliver was talking about, the Office for Faculty Education, uh, Equity and Welfare has been instrumental. Um, but in terms of diversity, I think it's important to say our job is to educate and to produce knowledge. And obviously there's a dialectical relationship between the two because that knowledge then becomes part of the educational process. And so I would argue that we cannot produce the knowledge that we need to produce to solve society's great problems without taking advantage of the, of the full scope of humanity. And I'm going to give two examples of what I mean by that. Um, the first is just asking what questions we're not asking. Hmm. So in the 1880s, um, scholars discovered the remains of a Viking. And this was the foundation of much of the study of, of Viking history moving forward. Those who discovered the body assumed it was a powerful warrior because they were buried with the cache of weapons. Two horses had been sacrificed and buried with them. An elaborate game set, um, including the boards and pieces that looked much like chess, sat on the corpse's lap and suggested that they had been involved in strategy and uh, planning of war. And it was simply assumed that this person was male. And again, this is the foundation for our study of Viking history moving forward. And a few years ago, two female anthropologists looked at the bones and said, huh, this perhaps is a woman. And it ends up that it in fact was a female. And you can imagine um, how different our understanding of Viking society might have been um, if we had asked that question in the beginning. And it was just not something that anyone in the room thought to ask because no one had a set of lived experiences that would have led them to ask that question. The other example I wanna give is an astrophysicist named Wanda Diaz Merced. She was in graduate school when she began to lose her sight. And anyone who's watched the show, The Big Bang Theory and seen the character Raj do his work as an astrophysicist knows that in astrophysics, you tend to look at screens and, and monitor the universe visually. And so she knew that she could not move forward in her career without sight. And what she realized was that the light curves that she could no longer see could actually be translated into sound. And so what she developed over the course of her career is a set of sounds to associate with all of those celestial bodies that the other astrophysicists were looking at. And she can actually detect things in the universe that the sighted astrophysicists cannot. 
And to just understand that we have a very specific way in the academy that we produce knowledge, that we understand things, that we expect people's brains to work, and that perhaps there are many things, as we see with Dr. Viesmer said, that perhaps we're not seeing because we are limited in the type of people that we have in our labs and in our classrooms. And so I would argue that Berkeley cannot fulfill its true public mission and be the engine both for education and knowledge production that it should be if we don't take advantage of the full scope of human capacity in our classrooms, in our labs, and in our research efforts. Thanks for that. Um, Oliver, how does it look from where you sit in terms of our undergraduate population and the benefits of a more diverse student population, also the challenges we face given our current demographic makeup? I think we it's it's essential that the student, you know, the demographics of the student body are representative of the state of California. I think there's no way to justify it being otherwise, and also I think it, it we fail as an, a public institution if we don't if we don't achieve that. Um, it's also good for it's for the ideas thinking outside the box that we normally do. I think it's 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 really comfortable for 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 people to think that it you know they they can talk to people who are like themselves. I remember when I first started as an uh, as a professor, it took me a long time to realize that it's not the talents that the, stu the, the students' talents that I had um, that they had they shared. That wasn't what made things work. It was the ones that they had that I didn't have, and vice versa. And the perspective you gain by that is just is is extraordinary. And so for us, the fact that you have students from all over the state of California and from uh, and international students and out of state students coming here in this what is a melting pot of cultures, civilizations, thoughts, that's extraordinary. And if if it's if it's not if the diversity does not represent the state of California, then we're not really it, it, we're not going to get what we sh could get out of it. And the students are not going to get the education that they should get out of it either, because part of coming to campus and part of being a student is not the things that happen in the classroom. Hmm. It's the things that happen outside the classroom. And it's also the engagements faculty have outside the classroom in office hours, talking to student groups, hearing students, you know, concerns, perspectives that affects faculty just as much as it affects students. I think, you know, it's very, if you look at faculty and their journey through the through their, their careers at Berkeley, they're affected by the students in profound ways, in ways that we don't really think about. Hmm. The ways they think about life, the way they think about society, that's all, that's really affected by our students and how we engage with our students. The, the, the journey the other way is emphasized a lot, what students learn from faculty, but I think there's also this huge, hmm. huge influence that students have on faculty. The types of research they do, how they engage, how they teach, what inspires them, what makes them think about the world. Um, and I think we saw some of that during the pandemic when things were called out that we hadn't really called out explicitly before. Um, you know, challenges students faced because of their mm. living circumstances that, you know, we could not expect that everyone has internet connection. We could mm. not expect that everyone has a place, quiet place that they can go to do an exam. And we have to work around that. And in the course of working around that, we come up with all these other solutions and all these other strategies that ultimately made us all move forward as a campus as well. You know, I want to pick up on something the, the words popped up a few times in, in the course of your answers and that, that word's engagement. And mm -hmm. I'd like you to unpack what you mean by that. Because when I think about engagement, just thinking back on my own collegiate career was, you know, questions and answers during a lecture in the classroom and office hours. Mm -hmm. Does it mean something different these days? Um, I think it can be much richer these days hmm. because you can have office hours where the person doesn't have to come to your office. You can have them remotely now. You can engage with students by email. You can engage students by letters. Um, you can engage them in the class. We're much more thoughtful and deliberate about this type of engagement than the, we were before. 
like calling office hours office hours rather than just you know chat hours or mm-hmm. get together hours we're i thought i feel that we're much more thoughtful about that um we also you know students need more support from us in ways that are different you know so one of the amazing things about berkeley is how many of our students go on to gra- undergraduates go on to graduate school you know it's remarkable some of our programs have the highest number of like a geography and mechanical engineering have the highest number of students who go on to phd programs in the country wow now in order for them to do that they need letters of recommendations from instructors so that means instructors need to sit down with them and figure out like where are you applying how can i help how do i engage that way so that didn't happen a few years ago now it's much more. We're seeing many more students going to graduate school. We're seeing many more engagements of this type. But to me, uh, you know, I call it vitamin cal. There's nothing like, yeah, I know you have a different name for it, but it's, you know, that thing you feel around campus when you're engaging with students and that energy you get from them and hearing their stories and just feeling inspired by what they're doing and where they're going and where they've come from. And I think there's there's something about being on campus that that brings that that's just different and really special and that we didn't have two years ago because no one there were very few people on campus and it felt totally empty. But feeling that now again and just there's a it's it's extraordinary how energizing it is. I have a question I want to pose to both of you from somebody in the audience. But before I do that, I wanted to remind everybody, including uh, folks who joined us late, that if you do have questions for Oliver or Lisa, we'd welcome them and they can be posted to our Facebook Live site. The question is um, that, that came in and, and it's, it's simple and profound. Um, I think it's from a student who says, I have a traumatic brain injury and that shouldn't limit me, but I'm worried about transportation. Um, and something that's so basic, and maybe we don't spend a lot of time thinking about, but is this this the kind of question you run into a lot? And what can you tell the person who's posed this question to us? How do we think about, is that within your domain? Just thinking about the the basic parts of life and getting around, Oliver. Yeah, so there are I've thought about this because I've noticed the amount of sco- students going on scooters all over campus now um, and how they're using that to get from one classroom to another quickly. Um, for the stu- There is a loop service that students can use to go from classroom to classroom. So I would encourage the student to reach out. To reach out. And I'm really sorry to hear about their, their injury. And I hope, I hope they get well soon. Yeah. Um, Lisa, is that something that these kind of questions that, you know, very, very basic, but essential to to accessing all the university has to offer? Well, I mean, that's our job. I know um, Steve Sutton is talking about every door being the right door. This is the challenge at Berkeley is that you might have a question that seems very simple, but you have no idea who to ask. Mm -hmm. And so we do get a lot of those questions because it's our job to just make this place smaller and to triage and help someone contact the right person. That's often the challenge at Berkeley. We actually have the resource. It's knowing how to access it. And so absolutely, that's our job. That's all of our jobs to try to make this place just feel a little more manageable. I have to say, as someone who had an ACL tear as a freshman and walked around this campus with crutches for eight weeks before realizing that that loop service existed at that time, it would have been really nice to have known that I could have asked the question. So I feel very, I feel a lot of sympathy about just the difficulty of getting around and Students need to know that we're here for, for them, right? We're here for that to help just make things a little simpler. Yeah. And I would just to follow up, I would su- suggest that the student also lets their instructors know that they're commuting from classes cl- from across campus and that it's a challenge. So the instructor can help, you know, with class material and just to make the life things a bit easier for the student. Yeah. Um, good point. Uh, you know, Lisa, an inherent part of all that you and Oliver are talking about is just this orientation to, to student needs. And let's focus down a little bit. How does the campus see graduate students? Because obviously they play many different roles. Talk to me, talk to us a little bit about how they're seen in, within the context of the institution and its academic mission. 
The way I've been talking about it is that we can't be a top research university without really robust graduate programs. And so I would like to say that the graduate students are the fulcrum upon which both the undergraduate education enterprise and the faculty research enterprise sit. For undergraduates, they make this place smaller. They help students understand course material. Often they're the first line of contact within classes because they're easier to get in touch with sometimes or just feel less intimidating than faculty. And so the quality of undergraduate education here, in my experience, really is driven by the graduate students, instructors. And then for faculty, graduate students are the folks who ask us those tough questions, who help push our edges in terms of our research protocols, in terms of what it is we're looking at. They're the ones that are really trying to push the boundaries of our disciplines. And so they keep us engaged. They keep us excited. In many cases, they do the research in labs. They're the ones that actually are conducting the experiments and keeping things going. And so really both parts of, of the campus uh, depend on our graduate students. And I, I like to think about campus as an ecosystem, and that includes staff, faculty, students, both undergraduate and graduate, and every piece of that ecosystem has to be healthy in order for us to engage with our public mission and really do the work we need to do at the level that we want to do it. Really interesting. So that vision of how we see graduate students is, what does that imply in terms of things we need to do different or better? I think it's more just making sure that we understand that they're essential to the work that we're doing, right? Yeah. So we, we've done a lot of work on this campus. We were actually on the cutting edge of ensuring that graduate students had to have pedagogical training before they went into the classroom. We were one of the first schools to do that. Sure. I think we, we do really good work in that area. We're now moving into the area that Oliver mentioned of universal design. So training students to design their courses so that they're accessible without having to go through an accommodation process. I think making sure that we uh, advise faculty and make sure faculty are transparent about what mentorship should look like, what expectations should be, what graduate students should be able to expect of their faculty members so there's no miscommunication. It's such a critical relationship that they have with their advisors. And so I think it's just making sure that everyone kind of knows what to expect, that they know where resources are, and that they're able to do what they want to do and know that they're an important and valued part of our community. Uh, just had a really interesting question that's come in from a member of our faculty for both of you. And the question is, is the university looking at a more equitable way of providing feedback on learning rather than an archaic and biased method of grading? Oliver, let me start with you, and Lisa, I'll, I'll come to you with the same question. So the answer is yes, so <laughs> short. Um, so right now, so one of the things that we've, um, that there's been lots of discussion about grading, especially because we have we implemented a pass no pass grading scheme at the beginning of the pandemic oh, for the right. first semester. And that caused a tremendous amount of discussion as much discussion actually about as uh, going remote um, because faculty then started to question what are students learning in my class what really is the what does a passing grade in a class mean um, and then people also started to realize that you know well many of our students who come here especially the first year you know they're coming from very different backgrounds some students come in with 30 units of ap credit others come in with none and so you have students taking Chem 1A who've already taken AP Chem. And so they're, it's almost like they're taking the class again, but, the class, but their grade for the class is based, it, the grade for the class for the students who haven't taken AP are, are is dependent on indir indirectly on the students who've already taken the AP Chemistry. And so it's, an, an, and it's an, an inequitable system. So there's a discussion right now in the Senate about looking at our grading for the first year yes. to make it more equitable for our students so they can get a good start uh, and, and not feel that like the first mid doing poorly in the first midterm in your first semester at Berkeley is, is basically the end of your GPA at Berkeley. And similarly, we're also one of the things that uh, we're also being very deliberate about is what does this mean for transfer students mm. and transfer students with their first semester of experience at Berkeley. So trying to implement the same changes for transfer students for their first semester. 
Now, I don't have the authority to do this. That's the, that's the purview of the Senate, but the Senate is looking at this right now. And um, they, the Committee of Undergraduate, the Undergraduate Council view this as being their most important work this year. Um, they're really a, amazing group of very dedicated faculty and students and I'm, I'm very hopeful we'll, we will come out of this with, with a change and then that will lead to the change that the person is talking about. The other piece that we can do is to the other campus initiative that we're promoting is the discovery initiative which is to give every student an experiential learning or a, an immersive learning experience and build that into our curriculum, build that into part of being a Berkeley student. And when you do that, you can't grade a discovery experience on a curve. And that will change how we view grading and how we view mastery and how we view a successful undergraduate education. So, you know, we've been grading on this, using the same system for over a hundred years. It's gonna take time to change it. But I really do think that there's there's momentum to, to, to change now that wasn't there before. And I'm really happy to see that. Lisa, what does what's the grading issue look like from your perch? So I also co-chair with Sunny Lee, the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Student Mental Health. And what has become very clear out of that committee is that the, the academic environment, the competitive nature, right? This idea that only 10% of the student can get A's. And that by definition in a class, then you are in competition with one another. You don't want to study with someone because they might do better than you. I'm like, it creates all of these pernicious outcomes and, and outcomes that really hurt student well-being. And as a parent of someone who, who was when he was applying for college, Berkeley's reputation, even compared to UCLA, is, is cutthroat, right? This idea that we're competitive, that it's that it's it's sink or swim. Um, and so I think that whole culture actually really hurts our students. And so if you're grading on a curve, what you're really doing is saying that our job is, is not assessment, but rather gatekeeping. And if what we really want to do as an institution of higher education is ensure that students master the subject matter, it shouldn't, you know, like in my classes, what I do is I let students, if they want, they can rewrite their papers, right? If they get it on the third try, they got it, right? Isn't the point that they got it, not necessarily when or how, or, or that in, you know, in that one week where they might've had you know, a bipolar roommate that lost it or, you know, the, all the things that happen in life that tests one shot high risk assessments are not good pedagogy. And so I think that's the conversation that's been happening on campus, that it's much better to have much more regular assessments that are really developmental and that are about subject mastery rather than necessarily where do you sit in a hierarchy relative to your other classmates. And so these are the kinds of conversations, as Oliver said, that I think really got much more traction during COVID and during the pandemic that I hope can come to a place where what, what it's really about is that student's intellectual development relative to the subject matter you're trying to teach. It's not whether or not they're 0.5 percentage points below the line for a B plus. Um, I want to step back to sort of really big, a big overarching issue. I think both of you saw a message put out at the beginning of the semester by the executive dean of LNS, uh, Jenna Johnson Hanks, and it was really about what she perceives to be sort of almost an existential threat to the very notion of higher education. She quoted a survey that found 42% of Americans think that colleges and universities, quote, have a negative effect on the way things are going in this country today. And she posed this question in her message. And I continue to think about it. And I want to ask both of you what you think, and which is who are we and what do we stand for? How is our role evolving? So, just to step all the way back, Lisa, I want to start with you about what do you see in terms of the role, the status of higher education, about how we're operating now compared to how we operated in the past and maybe how we should be operating in the future? Talk about this in the sort of that highest level. Well, I wouldn't claim to have all, all the answers. It's a big question. I, I fundamentally think higher education is about helping people achieve their dreams. Hmm. And I just look to my own experience. My parents arrived in this country in 1961 with two suitcases of used clothing, expecting their return to Cuba was imminent. I ended up graduating from one of the best institutions in the world. I have a PhD. None of that would have been possible without Berkeley. I had no idea what I was doing when I got to this campus. And I'm very grateful to having had that experience, that opportunity to develop and to imagine myself in this place. And that's what we do for our students. And so, 
I think we have to remember that the negative framing of higher education is, is part of a systematic funded effort that, that has been ongoing for decades. This didn't just happen. You've had report after report after report criticizing uh, what college is, what the value proposition is, how much people make when they get out, all these things. And so, and we haven't had the other side really systematically talking about what value we are producing, what opportunities we are giving, and, and why it is, I was a comparative literature and Latin American studies undergraduate double major, right? Talk about irrational, impractical degrees that have been tremendously helpful to me. And I've been heartened by all of the news recently that the number of humanities degrees is actually going up. And so perhaps there's a movement away from this idea that it's all about just how much money you make coming out. It's really about helping people kind of move into adulthood. It's really about helping people explore new things and, and reach their full potential and um, helping them really figure out who they want to be and how they want to be in the world. And I think we have to be much better about articulating that, about it's not what your starting salary is. It's really having a job that feeds you and that gives you the, the space and the ability, obviously, to feed your family and take care of the things that you care about, but also to feel good about the work that you're doing every day and to feel like you have reached your full potential as a human being. And so I, I do think the world of work has changed. I think as, again, as a parent, I have a senior right now. I think the application process is, is vicious and <laughs> inhumane uh, for college seniors. The stress around it is a little crazy. So I think we need to figure out how to, how to change that whole process. But I think in the end, the work that we're doing to help young adults reach the next level and, and launch themselves into their adult lives, I think is critically important and something that we should be proud of doing every day. Thank you. That's a beautiful answer. Um, and Oliver, you need to follow that one up. Um, your yeah. own perspectives about that big picture of higher education. Um, so, and, yeah. So big picture, um, you know, I came to the United States from Ireland to do graduate studies because this was the place to go to graduate school. Like graduate schools in the United States were regarded as the best in the world. And you could just see the transformation it had, you know, the engine of mobility the big public universities have in this country is extraordinary. But I think part of the 42% needs to be framed in terms of public support for universities. So if we just if we look at what happened after 2008 with the financial crisis, hmm. public, the state support for public universities across the country just dropped off a cliff. And the way to compensate for that was for students to take out more loans. And so part of the backlash we're seeing is that education has become more expensive, especially public education, in part because state support has dwindled for it. And so it's, it is it is on, it's an unfortunate consequence of our political system that declining, remo giving less funding for public education is viewed somehow as a political win when it's absolutely not the right thing. And I think what we're seeing right now in our democracy is part of that because the things that you learn in, in university, critical thinking, communication skills, learning how to do research, and basically learning how to be a lifelong learner, those things would be very helpful to us as a society right now. If more people thought about the news they read, the things they heard, and that if they could look at public universities as being a source for the public good, a source for the social transformation that it is. I mean, I run into students all the time who, you know, former students from Berkeley, and I love hearing their stories. I love hearing where they started from and where they ended up. And it's just so inspiring. So I wish for every all of the 42%, if they could just hear some of the stories of the transformations that happen on, on, a, on our campus, but also on every public university in the country. And I think that would be a huge, uh, you know, I think that would be a game changer. And we also need to get the word out that we need more federal support for public education. You know, the Pell Grant used to cover, when it first came out in 1974, covered 80% of your tuition at a public university. Now it doesn't. It's basically $6,000 maximum, which does not cover, it does not sufficiently cover the cost of education. So doubling the Pell would be cost the United States $30 billion a year. And just think about how much good that would do. 
So I can't think of a better way to end what's been a really wide ranging and fascinating conversation with the two answers you both gave, which were inspirational and sobering somehow at the, at the very same time. So Lisa and Oliver, thanks so much for your time um, and for the thoughtfulness and your dedication to the university's mission. It was great to have you here today. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, Dan. My pleasure. And thanks everybody for joining us. We look forward to seeing you for the next campus conversation, which if I'm not mistaken, will be our traditional semester wrap up with none other than Chancellor Carol Christ. Enjoy the rest of your day and thanks again for joining us.